Bob Morowski, you put out some fantastic Blu-rays through uh, Grindhouse Releasing, a company you started with Sage Stallone, who is no longer with us. And I was wondering if you could start the interview by saying a few <laughs> nice words about Sage. Uh, saying a few things about Sage? Yeah, I mean, Sage was um, was one of my dearest friends. Um, he was somebody who um, was almost like a brother to me. And um, we met uh, a few years um, quite a few years ago, back in the mid '90s, uh, through our mutual friend uh, Bill Lustig, oh. and um, immediately just became like best friends. And um, really, um, um, I really missed the guy. And he, you know, we 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 both loved loved movies, you know, more than anything else. And particularly, we loved uh, you know a lot of these obs- more obscure um, Italian movies. Um, and old exploitation films and uh, just like, you know, off, offbeat kind of non-Hollywood movies. And, um, he, uh, you know, because Sage was uh, the son of Sylvester Stallone, um, he was um, going to Rome um, to, to co-star in a movie with his dad, a, a movie called Daylight. And um, he said, well, when I'm over there, I, I, you know, I'm going to try to get some movies, and then you know maybe we can uh, you know cut, get the rights to some of these movies that we love and, and start a company. And uh, so when he was over there, um, he did. He, he tracked down the the um, distributors who own the rights to um, Lucio Fulci's movie The Beyond and um, Gates of Hell and um, a lot of the other movies that we really loved, uh, uh, Cannibal Ferox, which is uh, <laughs> an Inverto Lindsay movie. Yeah. And um, he bought. Uh, beyond in uh, Cannibal Ferox while he was there, and um, that was sort of the the start of our company. And the idea, you know, was um, I mean at that time it was a little different than it is now because people didn't really have much respect for those kind of movies, and there weren't really any companies releasing them uh, in the U.S. And uh, when the movies were released, they were just put out with like the worst possible presentations, with you know really bad transfers and and horrible prints and um, just the total like lack of regard for the movie. They were just viewed as, as, as product for these you know, cheap companies that put them out. And, um, you know, we, we thought that they were great movies and worthy of a studio-level um, release. You know, something like Criterion Films would have, would have, would have done with their movies. Um, so, so that was the idea, you know, going back to the original negatives, trying to shoot interviews with the directors and the actors and, you know, anybody associated with the movie, and, um, you know, at that point, nobody was really doing that. Now, now we're lucky enough that we have a lot of companies, um, you know, like Blue Underground and Synapse and Vinegar Syndrome and all, all these other um, labels who are kind of doing it and, and really treating these movies with, with respect. But back then, nobody was, and, and that was really the, uh, the reason for starting Grindhouse Releasing. So you mentioned Cannibal Ferox, which I love. It's yeah. it's a repugnant and wonderful film, uh, mm-hmm. and those things are contradictions. I don't think. Uh, but you guys are also putting out on Grindhouse releasing uh, the the definitive version, I imagine, of the Tough Ones, which is yes, we are. Yeah. Right. So look, we, we we Sage and I both loved him, lo- love him, loved him, Bertel Lindsay. Yeah. Um, and uh, Sage actually, when when he was over there initially in the mid '90s, doing daylight with his dad, he not only became friends with uh, uh, Fulci, but he became friends with Umberto as well oh. and spent quite a bit of time with him. And, um, you know, I, I don't think Sage was ever really that crazy about um, Make Them Die Slowly, which was the American version <laughs> version of the movie. But right. he really loved Lindsay's um, cop movies, like, you know, uh, the, these uh, kind of dirty, hairy um, action films that uh, Lindsay made a, uh, quite a few of them in, in the mid-70s. And, and those were the, the, the movies that Sage really loved, and um, one of which was um, the Tough Ones, a.k.a. Roma Almano Armata, a.k.a. Assault with a Deadly Weapon. Right. And so um, in addition to you know get, getting uh, Cannibal Ferox, um, he also got the rights to uh, Roma Almano Armata uh, you know, back in ni- 1996 as well. So um, it's been a long time coming on that release, uh, and I'm, I'm glad, you know, Sadly, Sage passed away a few years ago, and, and we, we never were able to get, get the movie out while he was still around. But, um, you know, he would be so happy that we're finally getting it into release. You know, we finally uh, got access to the elements and um, just did a, our usual, like, A-plus level um, 
you know, restoration on the movie. Um, we, I, I scanned it in 4K, you know, um, and we just really spared no expenses trying to make it like the best possible release. And it's the the um, Blu-ray is, is is going to be a, a, a three disc set with uh, two Blu-rays um, with the movie and and hours and hours and hours of interviews and extras and um, uh, a, a company accompanying copy of the um, uh, CD soundtrack by uh, Franco Michelizzi, uh, which we've also remastered, and um, it sounds incredible, and it's such great music. I mean, Sage was, and I were both huge fans of uh, Michelizzi, and as a matter of fact, um, when Sage uh, made the short film Vic, he hired uh, Michelizzi to do the score, because, you know, he loved his music so much. And uh, Nicolaitzi like contributed a really great score for Sage's uh, short film Vic. So um, it's 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 going to be a really great uh, release, and I'm so happy that after how many years? I, I 23 years. <laughs> I'm finally finally getting that one out. This of all of our releases, this one definitely took the most time, but I, I think it'll be worth it when people see it. Sounds very exciting, and so I, I'm assuming. Um that the reason why there hasn't been a Grindhouse releasing uh, Blu-ray in a few years is because you were busy editing Orson Welles' final film, The Other Side of the Wind, which was fantastic. So what were... Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I, I, I watched your uh, uh, the panel you did at the Venice Film Festival, and you uh, are obviously a very meticulous guy. You you, you take your time. And um, I was wondering, when you were researching Orson Welles, what were some of the most interesting things you learned about Orson Welles, the man, during that process? Um, you know, I, I, I learned... The, the biggest surprise to me was at that at that point in his career when he made Other Side of the Wind, even though he was only I think fifty five years old when he started making it, he was considered almost a, like a washed up has been, right. and was was basically here was a guy who was who's arguably the greatest American director of all time, you know who made not only Citizen Kane but you know Touch of Evil and uh, you know so many other movies that that I love um you know like Lady from Shanghai and The Trial and Othello and Macbeth and you know uh, you know the movies that he was do- doing in Europe and 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 had this incredibly illustrious stage career even before he started making films and then and then segued into uh the world of radio and was probably like the, the most famous radio personality so had had an like was a superstar even before he started making movies. So here, here, here was the early '70s, and he was like, you know, certainly in his prime and not even really that old, and was just considered to be washed up and, and couldn't get financing, and um, ended up having to make Other Side of the Wind, almost like a glorified student film, hmm. and um, was basically self-financing it at the start, and so you know people thought he was retired and and was just. Sort of this, um, you get a guy who showed up on, um, you know, uh, in, in playing cameo parts in movies and and uh, doing Palmas on wine commercials and <laughs> on the Tonight Show and Hollywood Squares and all these you know t- TV things, and figured that he you know he was no longer a filmmaker. But in, in actuality, every time he would do one of those shows, he would take that money and and you know buy film and and pay pay for shooting days for other side of the wind. And, and continued to make movies, you know, right up to the end of his life, and um, you know, wasn't just this, um, you know, kind of celebrity, you know, who, who just made, made, was on, on a lot of commercials and TV shows. Um, but um, just, you know, just the way that, that he was making the movie was like really like a almost like a low budget student film level. You know, it was grill of filmmaking at its, um, it, you know, finest. Um, you know, he, he he was hiring young crews who were, were just, you know, thrilled to work on the movie just because he was Orson Welles, so he didn't really have to pay them. <laughs> and, you know, they, they would do all the classic, you know, low-budget filmmaking tricks like, you know, renting a cam- camera package, you know, on weekends so they could get three days instead of, like, one day, and um, using all kinds of different film labs because, you know, he couldn't pay the bills at some of the labs. And, you know, it was, it was, it was constantly a shell game for him, basically, to... Um, you know, get the movie made. Um, shooting without permits, you know, and, and or, or having one permit and, and then erasing the date and rewriting new dates into it. And I heard stories where, um, you know, since they were shooting unpermitted, if, if the police would show up, 
Orson would, would would go hide in the in the back of somebody's car and cover himself with a blanket, and uh, and the rest of the crew would say that they were film students from USC, you know, shooting camera tests, <laughs> to, 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 because they knew if, if if Orson ever, you know, if people knew it was an Orson Welles picture, immediately they would think that you know it was a big budget film, which obviously it should have been, but given the level of respect that he had from his, his peers in the filmmaking industry, um, which was low for whatever reason. I mean, he was having to work at this like strange level of guerrilla filmmaking. So, I mean, that's that's one of the things that impressed me the most, the fact that he never gave up, he never quit. You know, he just, no matter what the circumstances were, he wanted to keep making movies and, and just um, did it, you know, however he needed to do it, which I, I found to be, like, you know, very impressive. Yeah, definitely inspiring. I uh, am currently finishing up reading uh, This is Orson Welles, the Peter Bardanovich yeah. interview book. And it's great, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's I was fantastic. Lucky to work with Peter on the movie. That's right. That's right. Um, so uh, there was one um, exchange, though, that really resonated with me when Bardanovich asks Welles uh, about his magic. And Welles says, Oh, well, I'm the world's greatest magician. Uh, and I was wondering, do you believe that Wells is kind of this, like, uh, this great magician, the world's greatest magician, as he said he was, and that his unjust treatment by the industry kind of makes him this, like, mythic ghost who haunts Hollywood to this day? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just look, the fact that he made a movie that was released, um, you know, several decades after his death and to great acclaim is, like, almost the greatest magic trick of all. <laughs> right. To, to, to materialize this this incredible movie um, from beyond the grave, and mm. um, and, and it was it, it was it was incredible working on it. I mean, he you know he was never able to finish it in his lifetime, but and when everybody was saying, well, maybe it was unfinishable, maybe he never finished shooting it, maybe he gave you know that it, it was just uh, too much of a mess, and and it was like could never come together but you know once we started working on it and, and cutting the footage and putting it all together we realized that, th- that there was a movie and um you know any of these myths and doubts that people had were totally unfounded huh. um so i mean yeah to me he was a great magician and in the literal sense yeah i mean he was he was somebody who always loved magic but as a as a director i mean you know a lot of the, the, lo- surprising how many great directors are actually like kind of amateur magicians. <laughs> um, Frank, Frank Marshall, who I worked with on the movie, is always also an amateur ma- magician. Um, Sam Raimi, um, who I've worked with on many occasions, is was was uh, a magician and knows a lot of magic tricks, and you know used to kind of uh, do do magic performances before he started making films when he was a, uh, a teenager. So um, you know, there's definitely uh, something to the idea that you know filmmaking is sort of um, a game of illusions, and you know, creating illusions, you know, for the audience that they, you know, uh, that, that, that they'll believe. And I think that's like kind of an inherent part of the process of uh, making a movie is like you know, creating those kind of amazing illusions. And uh, Orson was certainly a master. So I know I'm a decade late in saying this, uh, but congratulations on your Oscar win uh, for the Hurt Locker. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, recently, I, mean, I kind of feel the same way about it that Orson did. I, I kind of take it with a grain of salt and realize that it's you know probably that that and, you know four bucks will buy you a cup of coffee. But, uh, <laughs> For uh, sure, you know his his Oscar never really you know helped him that much. And and as a matter of fact, he you ended up u- using it as a prop and other side of the wind is like kind of a, a gag. Um, and then I think when he won the honorary Oscar um, around the time that he was making Other Side of the Wind. Um, he didn't even bother to go to the ceremony because he was, you know, so, so put off by the industry. And I think sent John Houston to accept the award and told everybody that Orson was in Europe, but in actuality he was in, in a bungalow at the uh, Beverly Hills Hotel, you know, just watching it and uh, kind of laughing with his friends. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it is a great honor. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish it, but, um, mm-hmm. but it's one of those things that, you know, it's, it's great the moment it's happening, but like you know, uh, the next day everybody forgets about it, and it oh. kind of becomes business as usual. But um, but yeah, it's it's great to have. I mean, I'm not going to complain about it. So I really enjoyed. Recently, I was in Los Angeles, and it was during the Oscars, uh, and I went to the uh, panel with the nominated editors, moderated by yeah, by yeah. Alan Hine. Uh, so yep. what what was that panel like? That must have been fun. 
Um, yeah, that, that was nerve wracking because it's you know it's it's the day before the Oscars, right? So timing wise, and you have to get up early to go to it. So yeah. so you're you know the last thing you want to do is like when you're trying to get ready to go to this big fancy event that you know is you know a lot of trepidation about and is really stressful. To, you know, go go to the Egyptian theater and sit on a panel and you know talk about the movie again. <laughs> but 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 it actually was very it was cool because you know my um, my wife was my uh, well, we weren't married at the time, but we've since got married. But you know, we ed- edited the movie together, and um, um, so it was nice being up there with her, so we, where we could both talk about something we had a- achieved together. And um, and then, of course, to be up there with Alan, who's such a great ed- editor himself, you know, having cut movies like all that jazz, you know, it's like he's such an accomplished film editor. Um, it, it, it was a real honor to be part of a you know presentation with him and um and then of course with all the other editors who were also great you know and hearing their stories but mo- mostly it was just the enthusiasm of the audience because it's always a packed house for those events and then um the audience which i guess is probably mostly full of young filmmakers are 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 so enthusiastic that you really feel like you know you're you're a celebrity because afterwards mm-hmm. The kids are mobbing around you and asking for autographs, and it's the kind of thing that you know normally we as editors don't get that kind of you know attention, right? You know because you know the the, the actors, of course, and, and the directors do, but um, you know to, to have people asking for your autograph is pretty pretty uh, pretty unusual, but actually pretty cool. So you know it was it's a fun event. Yeah, I, I got my picture with Spike Lee's editor. I, I think Did that's you really, cool. Yeah, cool, yeah. right? Yeah, it's cool yeah. to meet those guys, you know. And, it is. And uh, to be able to um, have a, a one-on-one. I mean, if I was not in the business, you know, I would definitely attend that show. So Nice. So um, yeah. I mentioned I was in Los Angeles for this. I was actually staying with someone who you worked with. I was staying with Christopher Young. Oh, yeah, I love Chris Young. I just spoke to him on the phone yesterday. We're, we're working on a project together right now, and, and oh. he's great. I mean, he's... I think, it, for for me, he's. I think I think he's one of the greatest composers working right now, and um, certainly my favorite. Um, uh, probably aside from Ennio Morricone, um, you know, Chris is Chris is uh, you know, right up there with with the the best of them, and um, I just I I think he's like, he's such a great composer because he really under has a strong sense of theme and melody and and really can can. Can cover any sort of genre. I mean, his his, his music is, is beautiful and emotional when it needs to be, or, or really nerve wracking and scary when it needs to be. Mm-hmm. And um, and and is not afraid of using unusual instrumentation and and um, uh, choir and um, basically any tool in, in the in the mu- you know with the composer's book. Uh, Chris is able to use with with um, perfection. So. I mean, I, I love him, and, and, and he's a great friend, and, and I'm always thrilled to be able to work with him. That's great. Well, you got to tell him that, that you were talking to Michael O'Keefe, because, you know, we... we uh, I will, yeah, and he, yeah. he's such a great guy, too. Oh, he's, really, he's so sweet. He's, he's been so nice to me over yeah. the years. What's yeah, that? He's been so nice to me over the years, because I see him... Oh, uh, yeah, he's great, yeah. great like that with everybody. He's so generous oh. with his time, and that's the, the other amazing thing about Chris, you know. Yeah, I really respect him. Uh, he's so nice to young people. He He really believes in mentorship. And, oh, I know. Oh, just unbelievable guy. So I, mean, wh- I was such a fan of the guy's work for, yeah. for many years, just for, as as a fan. I mean, all all of his music, from, you know, from the Hellraiser movies to, mm-hmm. um, you, you know, all like the thriller thrillers that he did in the in the nineties and hmm. um, things like you know, things like Copycat and Jennifer Aid and, um, you know, so many so many so many movies were you know the scores actually were so much. Better than the movies, in, in a lot, sometimes. A lot of times. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I just lo- loved his music, and, and we um, so when we finally got a chance to work with him, um, starting on Sam's movie, The Gift, um, we needed a composer, and, and I mentioned Chris, and, and um, you know we met with him, and Im- immediately it was like you know we were like old friends, all, all three, he, he, Sam, and I, like we had known each other for for forever. Mm-hmm. And just delivered such a great score for that movie, and then you know we got to work with them several times afterwards. You know, on Drag Me to Hell and Spidey Three, and hmm. um, just um, I've done a few other projects with them as well, including this um, this new movie that we're working on, a Norwegian horror film called uh, Lake of of the Lake of Death. 
um, uh, a Norwegian horror thriller um, shot entirely in Norwegian, made in uh, Norway, and, but shot on film and a real cool old uh, classic style horror movie, um, uh, like but atmospheric uh, supernatural movie in like the tr- tradition of like Val Luton and some of those guys. Ooh. Yeah, so it's he, a really cool project. They're shooting on, they shot on film, and it's directed by a, a woman named uh, Nini Robeson, who's um, a really accomplished director over there. And um, you know, I, she reached out to me to ask me if I wanted to be involved, and uh, of course, yeah. I mean, to, to do a cool project like that, absolutely. Hmm. And then um, I, I was able to get uh, Chris involved now, which is is going to be great. He's the best. He's the man. I can say yeah, so many nice things about him. But uh, but, but a, a, a strong segue now is the tough ones. Let's talk about the soundtrack because yeah. you guys always put out such rocking soundtracks, whether it's Pieces or Cannibal Ferox or The Beyond. You know, Fabio Frizi, We've I've interviewed him as yeah. well. He's fantastic. What, what he's can these... amazing, and, and yeah. I just love movie music. So yeah. I, I'm a huge, you know, I think the first record I ever bought as a kid was, was Jaws. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's a good and, one. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, and of course, uh, all the while I was growing up, I was collecting soundtracks and ordering soundtracks for, you know, like from Vori Saraband, like, you know, Dawn of the Dead and Phantasm. And, oh, nice. And kind of moving into imports, you know, with, with the all the Italian stuff like uh, uh, Goblin and, and, you know, Morricone and, and mm-hmm. Fabio and, and like uh, all the great Italian composers, Stelvio Cipriani and all that stuff. So, I, yeah, I've been collecting soundtracks ever since I was um, old enough to, like, you know, buy music. And um, so, of course, to me, you know, a lot of the reasons, you know, Sage and I both love these movies is they have such great music. And um, so to, for me, the next the extension of that was like packaging the um, soundtracks with, with the movies. Uh, I think the first one we did it with was uh, Big Gun Down, which is, has oh, yeah. incredible Ennio, Mor- Ennio Morricone soundtrack. So we always try to I always try to get get them retransferred from the original master tapes and at the highest possible, you know, um, resolution, like 24-bit, 192K resolution. And, and then, uh, you know, we totally remaster re, uh, everything, you know, the way we do with uh, the movies. So, if, so you know, if, it, if, if, it's a, if it's a soundtrack included with the Grindhouse releasing, release, it's going to be the you know, ultimate version of, mm-hmm. of that soundtrack in terms of sound quality. Yeah, the, what I love about Grindhouse releasing is it's re- truly about quality, not quantity. Yeah, yeah, because mm-hmm. for me it's and it's always been more of a um, hobby, I guess you might say. Mm-hmm. You know, something uh, uh, definitely a, a labor of love, and it's something I work on. You know, between movies, the movies that I'm editing, you know, the new movies, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, for Sage it was the same way. I mean, we both really just wanted these movies to, to finally get a fair shake because we were just tired of the way that they were being so poorly presented in the past. And I was, it was funny because. You know, people didn't even know how good these movies looked. Like, The Beyond was such a butchered release when it came out. It was, it was released as Seven Doors of Death in the U.S. Right. And um, it, was, it was, had about 10 or 15 minutes cut, cut from the movie. You know, they cut, all the violence, of course, was cut out to get an R rating. But then a, a lot of times, they, you know, these distributors would just cut the movies shorter just to uh, make them shorter so they could save on shipping costs to fit them on less, less reels. Um, when they were shipped to theaters, so um, you know the and the movies in, in uh, widescreen. It's it, it was shot in uh, two perf technoscope, but um, of, of course the old video transfers of Seven Doors of Death were all you know four by three with the uh, half of the image cropped off, <laughs> with like really bad, um, like the worst transfers, um, and and the worst biggest indignity of all on um, the Seven Doors of Death version was the fact that it, the American distributor didn't like Fabio Fritzi's incredible score, uh, basically oh. threw the score away and replaced it with this kind of like cheesy, uh, you know, 80s synthesizer score, <laughs> like kind of a generic, uh, you know, like uh, electronic horror score. That is so, revolting. Um, yeah, I mean, and when you think about how, what, what a classic, beautiful musical score uh, Fabio Fritzi created for that movie, mm. I mean, there's, there's no greater injustice that was done to a film. So, um, you know that was the that was that that was that Seven Doors of Death version was like the biggest motivator for for Sage to want to to go over and get get the Beyond, and um, 
when we, the first time we saw the Beyond uh, at the lab in Rome, when, when we struck the first print from the original negative at um, uh, Technicolor Lab in Rome, it was it, it was so beautiful that that it was just jaw dropping. You know, people didn't even realize how how beautifully shot and lit and um, composed that these movies were. You know, because they they just saw these horrible transfers, pan and scan, and, and got a, a the, the worst impression of the movie and. When you actually see them from the original negative, it's it, it's stunning, and you really have a lot a lot of respect for uh, you know the the DPs who shot these movies like Sergio Salvati, you know, because they were, were true craftsmen, and a lot of the crews on these movies worked you know worked on like you know the the Fellini movies and the Pasolini films and you know all those all the Antonioni movies and all the highly regarded Italian um, art movies, so, and and they, you know they were shot with you know. A lot of the same people involved, so I mean, they're they're really great great movies that deserve this kind of uh, attention. I think. I certainly agree with you, uh, Bob Morowski. Thank you so much for your time. Before thank I let you, you go, uh, yes, the pleasure is all mine, my friend. Before I let you go, may you give me the number one reason for Blu-ray collectors to add the tough ones to their shelf? The number one reason is that because it's coming from Grindhouse Releasing, whether you've heard of the movie or not, you know that it it, it has. Uh, the best possible presentation with a, a, a di- dynamite package that you know you, you will love every bit of, and um, it's an incredible movie, incredible action-packed movie that's uh, beyond entertaining. I think the, the biggest reason is that the movie is so entertaining. Even if you haven't heard of the movie, you will be thoroughly entertained from start to finish by the movie, The Tough Ones. And so you please, can uh, you get a pen when you have a chance. <laughs> you get a pen in the shape of a bullet. If you're one of the first, and you get a pen in the shape of a bullet, which is, which is incredible. <laughs> yeah. Um, only, but only the first 2,500 customers. So, so buy it now because if you don't, you'll you'll regret it for the rest of your life. Go to diabolicdvd.com. Diabolic DVD, yeah, uh, to guarantee getting that bullet pen, <laughs> and, and 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 also guarantee getting the best possible service. It's instead of spending hundreds of dollars on a, on eBay for it. I know, like, everybody complained because we did pieces with the jigsaw puzzle. I know, and, I heard about that. People didn't really listen to the warning. I kept saying, you know, we're only doing so many of these, and they're right. going to go out of print, and then, of course, people waited, and sure enough, it went out of print. So, <laughs> okay. You know, um, you got to get these things when you can. you got to do it. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you so much.